So last time we talked a little bit about the oscilloscope and the function generator, right? Um, I know that that was a while ago because we went on the, the field trip <laughs> last time. So um, how did everybody like the field trip? That's great. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so that went pretty well. I'm glad that you guys came out for that. Um, but the last time that we were in here, we talked about oscilloscopes and function generators. So let's do a quick review of those two. So which one of those pieces of equipment actually created a signal for us? Function generator. Function generator, that's exactly right. Um, so that would create the signal, and we could specify several different things about the signal. We could, there were three things in particular that we were able to specify. Anybody remember one of those? The yeah. shape. The shape, exactly. So there were a couple of different shapes that we could create. Um, anybody remember one of the shapes? Triangle. Triangle wave, sure. That looked kind of like this. What about another one? Square, Square, Square wave. wave. Yeah. And the last one? Sine wave. Sine wave. Perfect. Like that. So we could specify the shape of the signal that we created. What else could we specify about the signal? Um, we could specify how big it was, right? Yeah, the amplitude. So that was how many uh, volts it was. The larger the amplitude, the more voltage you had. So a large amplitude signal might look like this. And a small amplitude signal might be like this. Okay? So you could specify the amplitude. And then what was the last thing that we could specify? The period of time. Yeah, the period or the frequency. So the, uh, a high frequency signal might be something like this, whereas a low frequency signal might be more like that. So I tried to draw the amplitudes about the same. Um, it's just the, the frequency that's changing, the, how, how quickly the signal is repeating. And we said that the frequency and the period are related to each other, right? There was a formula. We said that the, if you know the, um, we said that the period is one divided by the frequency. And the frequency is one divided by the period. So if you know the period, you can calculate the frequency and vice versa. Okay, so that was a little bit about the function generator. We could use the function generator to create signals. And the reason that we use that, that we want to create signals, is we usually use them for testing out a circuit. For instance, we could use them to test out the fiber optic transmitter and receiver that we're going to be working with in a few days. Um, the, the transmitter normally creates a wave that is kind of like a sine wave. So if we wanted to test out the receiver, we could use the, the function generator to create the sine wave instead of the transmitter. Okay. And then we could specify all of these things about the signal coming from the, the function generator. So we usually use function generators to test out various circuits. Okay. So the other piece of equipment that we talked about last time was an oscilloscope. So an oscilloscope was sort of like a camera um, that allowed us to look at electrical signals. We were able to 
look at the signals on the screen, and we could see what shape they were, and we could use the oscilloscope to measure their period, their frequency, and their amplitude. So if we looked at the screen of an oscilloscope, it looked something like this. We had the outline, and then there were all of these lines going up and down the screen that divided the screen into these little boxes. <laughs> Anybody remember what the boxes were called? Yeah, divisions. Right? And at the bottom of the screen, there were markings that specified the number of volts per division and the number of seconds per division. Right? So we could use these markings to look at the screen and estimate how large our signal is. For instance, if we had a signal that looked kind of like this, and we knew that we had, um, say, two volts per division, we could figure out how much voltage our signal was, right? So what voltage would we have for the peak to peak voltage for this signal, approximately? Eight. Eight. Yeah, about, about eight volts, because we have one, two, three, four boxes from the bottom to the top, and each box is two volts. So that's a total of eight volts from top to bottom. So by looking at the number of squares, top to bottom and knowing how much voltage is in each square, we're able to figure out that we have approximately 8 volts peak to peak. And peak to peak was sometimes abbreviated PK dash PK. So we could mark a picture or something like that. And then we could also look at the time per division. So the time per division would be something like one millisecond per division. And we could use that to figure out the period of our signal. Remember the period was the amount of time from a spot on a wave to the same spot on the next wave. So we could look at the amount of time from the top to the bottom, the top of that wave, um, and we can count the number of boxes. So that's one, two, three, four boxes there as well. One millisecond per division, that means that we have, what, what would our period be in that case? Four milliseconds. Four milliseconds, exactly. So we have eight volts peak to peak and a four millisecond period. And then, since we know the period, we could use that to calculate the frequency of our wave as well. Right? There were a couple of other markings that were important on a graph like this. One of them was the zero level. Right? The zero level showed us where zero volts was on our signal. On the signals that we were looking at, zero volts was always right in the middle of the wave. It was halfway between the top and the bottom. And there was a little marking on the left-hand side of our screen to show us where that was. It's important to record that because zero volts is not always in the middle of your signal. Sometimes it could be down at the bottom of your signal. If the zero volt level were down here, then your, your signal would always be positive. Other times, the zero volt level could be up at the top of your signal and then the wave would be entirely negative. Or sometimes the zero volt level could be way down here or way up here. Um, it just depends on your signal. So if you want to be able to look at a picture and tell what's going on, you need to know where zero volts is. So it's important to write that down. The last marking that we put on our graphs was the trigger level. So we had a little arrow on the right-hand side over here that specified where the trigger level was. Remember, the trigger level was the thing that kept the signal 
frozen in place on the screen. And in order to do that, the trigger level had to be somewhere between the top and the bottom of your signal. If the trigger level was either too low or too high, that caused the signal to sort of shift back and forth all the time and, and be moving around constantly. And then it was very, very difficult to make any measurements. You couldn't hardly see what was going on. So you always want to have the trigger level between the top and the bottom of your signal in order to keep it frozen and steady on your screen. Right. Now, these are all ways that you can look at the screen and tell just by, by a glance how big your signal is, how often it's repeating, you know, how long each period is. But it's somewhat imprecise, right? Um, you, you can see that it's, the signal is going almost from the top of this line to the bottom of, of this line, but there's a little bit of difference there. So there, there can, this method is not the most accurate. Um, in order to get more precise measurements, you can actually use the measuring function of the oscilloscope itself. I'm not sure, did I talk about that last time? Maybe a little bit. Um, so the oscilloscope has built-in measurements. You can call them up and they will actually measure the period for you, they will measure the frequency, they will measure the peak-to-peak -peak voltage. They can do a lot of different functions. Um, and those are important to get precise measurements. But I really, I strongly encourage you to be able to use your skills and, and be able to eyeball this and approximate the size of your signal, the, the length of the period, things like that. Um, because sometimes the computerized measurements can make mistakes, okay? Sometimes if there's a lot of noise on your signal, you know, like this, and you, you ask the oscilloscope to measure the frequency of your signal, it ends up measuring the frequency of this noise rather than the frequency of the big signal that you want. So it's important to be able to look at the screen and say, oh yeah, that's a period of about four milliseconds. So that you know if your computer measurement comes back and says one microsecond, you know something's wrong there, right? If it says that the actual period is 3.95 milliseconds, then you, you can say, okay, well that's probably a more precise measurement than my eyeball, but it's still in the ballpark, right? So being able to look at the screen and get an approximation of of what you think these values should be is really a, an important skill to have, okay? So, any questions about that? Okay. All right, cool. So then, let's move on to today's topic. Today, we're gonna learn how to solder. So this is, this is a really cool thing because Today, for the first time, you're going to get to learn how to make your own circuits, okay? Um, so far, we've been talking about designing prototypes on breadboards and things like that, uh, which is cool, but they, they, don't, um, they don't last, right? They're, they're not good for long-term projects. So today, we're going to learn how to solder, and you guys will be able to learn how to make um, breadboards that that actually will you know last for long-term projects you can use them for um, you, you can get all kinds of kits and things off the internet and you can build all kinds of things yourself if you know how to solder so today we're gonna learn how to do that so basically the process of soldering involves well, well, the purpose of soldering is to attach two things together. You can either attach two ends of a wire together, or you can attach a component into a breadboard. In either case, you're making an electrical connection between two things. Okay, so that's really the purpose of soldering. 
So let's talk a little bit about how it works. Okay. What happens is that you have two components that you want to attach together, and the way that you do that is you put them close together, and then you use a very hot iron to melt a little bit of flexible metal called solder. And that solder flows down into the joint between your two components, and then when you take the iron away, the metal cools down and it solidifies, and it forms a joint between your two components, either between two ends of a wire or um, your, the end of your component and uh, a PCB, a printed circuit board. Okay? So let's talk a little bit more about the right way to actually do all of that. So what happens is that when When you're soldering things together, the real key is that you want the components to be very, very hot when the soldering takes place. Okay? When the components heat up, the metal um, it, it heats up and it expands a little bit, and it is better able to accept the solder. So when, when the components are hot and you, you drip some molten solder onto those hot components, the solder melds with those components and the, the metals fuse together and it makes a very strong joint. Okay, so the components have to be hot when you put the solder on. What happens if the components are cold is that the solder just sort of drips on top and, and sits there, okay? And it doesn't make a good joint at all. That's when it, it just drips on top and sits there, it's called a cold solder joint because the components are cold. And, and if we say that you have a cold solder joint, that means that that solder joint is bad. Um, it means that the metals did not make a good connection with each other and that joint is likely to fail. It might not even make a very good electrical connection at the beginning. Even if it does make a connection at the beginning, it's likely to break um, soon and, and it will not be sturdy, it won't hold up for the long term. So the real key to soldering is getting all of the components hot before you put the solder on them. Okay? So that's, that's the number one mistake that people make, is that they don't keep the components up enough before they put the solder on. They, they just keep the solder up itself and sort of drip it on. So the real key to soldering is to heat up all the components. So let's talk about how you do that. So imagine that this thing I've drawn on the board is a side view, a cross section of a printed circuit board. So this is a little hole in the circuit board in the middle, and you've got a component that is going down through this hole in the circuit board. Okay? And you want to make a joint so that this component gets attached to the circuit board. So what you want to do is that you want to start off with your soldering iron over here. So this is the tip of your soldering iron. And you want to put a little drip of solder onto the end of this iron. Okay? This little drip of solder sits on the iron and it will allow the iron to conduct the heat much better. Okay? And we'll see why in just a second. So you, you start off by putting a little drip of solder on that iron, and then you bring the iron in, and you, you touch the iron to the board down here. And this little drip of solder kind of sits right here, and a little bit down there. So what this does is that this little drip of solder makes a good thermal conduction between the iron, which is really hot, and your component and board, which you want to heat up. Okay? So this little drip allows the iron to conduct the heat into these two components. If that drip were not there, then 
the only place that the iron would be touching would be at the very tip here. Okay? And, and that's, that's hardly any space at all. So it would be very hard to heat anything up if you're just touching it with this little bit. So we put a little drip on at the beginning, and that allows much more area between the iron and the components. So you're able to heat up these components and the board much more effectively. Okay? So you put the so the first step is to put the drip on the iron. Next step is to move the solder iron in and touch it to the lead and the board. The third step, the critical step, is to wait for a count of maybe four seconds. So you, you touch it on there and then you go one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand. And that time allows your component and your board to heat up. Remember that's the, the critical thing, okay? So you allow that time for these two parts to heat up. And then you bring the solder wire down from the other side and you touch it to your component and your board, okay? Notice you're not touching it to the iron, you're just touching it to the component and the board. What this does is that it forces, it forces you to wait until everything is hot enough. If the component and the board are not hot enough, the solder won't melt, okay? It only melts when your component and your board reach the correct temperature. So you bring the solder in, hopefully your component and your board are warm by that point, and then the solder starts to melt. And you should see it melt and flow down and, and start to dribble down around your, your component, and you can sort of paint it around a little bit at that point and get it in all the cracks and, and allow it to make a nice um, joint between your component and your board, okay? So that should only take a second or two. Once you've gotten the solder all over where you want it to go, you take the solder wire away, you lift your iron off the board, and you let the joint cool. It should be cool enough to handle in 15 or 20 seconds, okay? Yeah? Uh, will we be demonstrating product? Yes, yes, absolutely, in just a second. I just wanted to give you sort of this theory on the board here, because it's sort of hard to uh, see exactly what's going on. But I will be uh, doing a demonstration in just a second. Yeah? Just curiosity, what is solder cutting like? Is it copper or is it? So there, that's a great question. There are a lot of different types of solder. Um, a lot of times the solder is made out of lead and tin. That's sort of the, the standard mix for solder. And oftentimes, the solder itself contains this material called flux, which helps the metal to flow and, <coughs> and prepares the joint to make a, a secure connection. So if you were to take a cross section of a piece of solder wire, you would see little, um, little tubes of this flux sort of running all along the inside, okay? So this is called rosin core solder when it has the flux already built in, okay? Now, you guys probably know that lead is um, harmful, especially in, in large quantities. Um, it, it can be poisonous, it can have bad health effects. So this is an important thing to remember when you're working with solder, it's important to wash your hands after you're done. Um, because lead can be poisonous and harmful, certain types of solder are made without lead. It's called lead-free solder. Um, we don't use lead-free solder in this class because it's more difficult to work with. Okay? Um, the fiber optic communicator kits that you buy come with your own rolls of solder, but those rolls are lead-free. So we um, 
So, so you should not use those little rolls that come in your kits, okay? Uh, because they are difficult to work with. We will give you all the solder that you need. Um, just don't use those in this class because it'll just be very difficult for you, okay? Um, so if you are interested in learning how to use lead-free solder, um, it's, we, we teach that, but we teach that in the um, semester-long soldering class, okay? Today we're just going to touch on the, the basics of soldering, uh, but if you get into it and you really like it, then I highly recommend the, the semester-long class. They teach you all kinds of advanced stuff, lead-free solder, surface mount solder, where you learn how to surface, uh, solder parts that just sit on the surface of the board. So, very cool stuff. Did you have a question? Yeah. 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 So, yes, there. Um, that's a great point. When you heat up solder, um, it smokes a little bit, and you want to get rid of those fumes. So there are little fans that sit on each desk that have filters built in that will draw the fumes away from you. So you should definitely turn those on when you are soldering. All right, so that's enough talking. Let me actually um, set this up and do a little bit of soldering. So in the lab, everybody is going to have a soldering station that looks something like this. Okay? There is a knob on the front right here, and there is a switch. So you turn the switch on, and then you set the knob to um, about six and a half. Okay? So that's six and a half on the inner dial there. That corresponds to about 650 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? Um, so you're going to set your soldering kit up like that. You're also going to moisten the sponge. There's a little sponge that sits in a tray here, and you're going to use this sponge for cleaning off the tip of your soldering iron. When you get to your station, the sponge will probably be dry, so you need to moisten it a little bit in order for it to be effective. To moisten it, you get a little bit of water. We have a little, um, we, we have a small squirt bottle of water that sits on the windowsill over by the fire extinguisher. So you just go over, you take your sponge over there, you squirt a little water on, um, and you squeeze out the excess into the garbage can that's right there. The sponge should be damp, but not soaking, okay? So just, just damp, but not, not too wet. Okay, so that's, how you get your station set up. The first thing that you're going to do for 
the lab today is that you're going to solder two ends of a wire together. We're going to have some wire for you over in the lab. So you're, you're going to cut a small piece of wire off. Um, everybody's going to check out one of these kits, one kit per uh, desk. And this kit includes a pair of wire strippers. So you're going to take your wire strippers over. You're going to cut off a small piece of wire from a big roll. And then you're going to use the strippers to cut the um, insulation off both ends of the wire. Okay. Um, once you do that and you expose the two ends of the wire, you're going to solder them together. So um, I don't have any wire with me, but I'm just going to solder two ends of uh, these two legs from an LED together so that you guys can see what's going on. Okay? So I bent the two leg legs of the LED together. Um, and now we'll, we'll zoom in a little bit. got the two ends of the LED together, and you'll notice that they're, they're very close to each other. Okay, That's what you want. You want them to be right next to each other. With the LED, it's pretty easy because it's all one contained package. With the, the wires, you'll want to grip one end of the wire in one of these little alligator clips, and then the other end of the wire in the other alligator clip, and just bring them uh, close together and set them up so that the wires are, are laying right next to each other. You can also do a trick where you bend the wires and they, they sort of bend around each other. Um, that's perfectly fine too. Um, whatever works best for you. Okay. Then it's just about time to solder. Okay. So when you check out your kit, you're also going to check out some solder. So it comes in these little rolls. It's easy to unwind. So you're going to unwind a little bit of that. And then you're going to wipe the, the tip of the soldering iron on the damp sponge. When you're done, the soldering iron should look nice and silver and shiny like that. Okay? If it sits for too long, it starts to get sort of brown and um, nasty looking. Um. So, <coughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Very, very important. How, how about flux? Mm. Um, I don't think that we're going to use uh, flux in this class. Um, some people like to use it, some people don't. It's sort of a, a preference. Um, if you can learn to solder without it, um, then it, it's nice. So I think we're, we're going to avoid it in this class. But yes, safety glasses, very important. Um, when you're soldering, the solder can sputter a little bit and and um, boil almost, and little drips of it can fly off. So if that hits you in the eye, it can be very um, very damaging. So it's very important to wear your safety glasses. All right. So again, you. Can I suggest something else? Uh, the board. Yes. Yes. Okay. Indeed. Thank you. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. So we have soldering boards here. Somebody's been, been through this before. Yes. We have soldering boards. Um, these are very important because they catch any drips that might fall from the solder. Um, and they prevent them from landing on the desk and, and burning the desk. So um, you want to put a solder board down before you actually do the Soldering. Yeah. So. so and now I get to focus on my uh, LED. 
kind of go with that. Um, okay, so <coughs> once you get it all set up, you wipe off the tip of your soldering iron, you put a small grip of solder on the end of the iron. And then, like I said, you move the iron in, you let the components heat up for three or four seconds, and then you move the solder in. So I'm gonna touch everything with the iron, count one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, bring the solder in, paint it around, and then move the solder and the iron away. And that's it. Um, so, so you notice I talked about this whole process for a good 40 minutes, and then the thing itself took about five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is the way that soldering generally goes. The setup takes a lot more time than the actual soldering itself, OK? Um, the, if, if you spend a little bit of time getting prepared and making sure that everything is, is set up just right, then <coughs> the soldering itself should go uh, pretty quickly and, and smoothly. Okay? It's important to get everything set up right so that the, uh, when you actually bring the solder in, everything just works. Okay? Um, so that's that's pretty much um, how you solder two components together. I'll pass this around so you guys can take a look. Um, I probably could have put a little bit more solder on this joint. If you look at it, you'll see that. Well, what you want to see is that the solder covers the entire joint, but it's not bloppy. Okay. If you look at this joint there are some spaces where the solder didn't quite flow in. So I could have used a little bit more. Um, it, it's definitely not gloppy. Um, so I, I probably just could have used a little bit more solder on this. So I'll pass this back. So that's how you solder uh, two wires together, OK? So let me show you how you can solder a component into a board. Okay. So you guys are going to uh, get practice boards that look something like this. And you are going to get practice resistors from a, a bin of old resistors. And you're going to practice soldering these resistors into the board. So there's nothing, um, nothing real fancy about the boards. They don't actually do anything. Um, there's nothing really fancy about the resistors. This is just a chance for you guys to practice. Okay? So what you do is you just look at the board and you find a spot that doesn't have any components soldered on. So I'm going to look over here, and I see that there's some holes over here that don't have any components. So you're going to take your resistor and put one side of the resistor into one of the holes, and the other side into the other hole. Okay? And then your resistor is going to stick out <coughs> the back of your board. hard to see, but there are legs of the resistor uh, sticking out there and there. I'm using an LED in this case, but you guys will use resistors. So there's legs there and there. So the process for soldering resistors into the board is very similar to the process of soldering two legs of a component together, or two, uh, two wires together. 
like I said before, what you do is you heat up the board and the resistor, and then you put the solder on, and then you uh, move away. So I'm going to start by wiping off the soldering iron just like before. I'm going to put a little drip of solder on the iron to help conduct the heat. And then I'm going to touch the iron to the board and the leg. Count 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 3 1,000, then bring the solder in, and then move the solder and the iron away. Okay? And that forms a, a nice little joint right there between the board and the leg. Okay? Let me try and show you what happens if you don't heat up the component first. Um, so if I just heat up the solder <coughs> and, and try and get this to drip down onto the board, um, then we would get something called a, a cold solder joint. So let's see if that's going to happen. Well, it's a little bit hard to see there. So I can do it from one of these other. It's just, it's not really doing it for me, but um, this, this first joint is what you are really looking for. Uh, it's got a nice cone-shaped uh, pattern of solder between the leg of the component and the board. It's very smooth and it makes a good connection. Uh, this, this other joint is not as smooth. Um, it, it's sort of more gloppy. It, it's standing up, um, and it's, it's not as good. So I'll pass this around um, in just a second. Also. When you look at the, the component from the other side of the board, then you can see on this first joint that I made, the, the solder flowed through and made a little bit of a connection on the other side of the board, which is good as well. On, on the second joint, where it was cold, the solder did not flow through the board, so it only made the connection on the one side, and it, it's not as secure. Okay? So it's important to uh, get the connection on both sides of the board. The last thing that you're going to do today is you're going to practice desoldering components. Okay? Um, sometimes when you put a component in the board, you, you take a look later on and you realize that you put the wrong component in. So then you have to take it out and put in a new one. Or sometimes you put the right component in, you use the board for a while, and one of the parts burns up. So you have to take it out and replace it with a good part. So in either, <coughs> in either of these circumstances, it's important to <coughs> be able to desolder a component and take it off the board so that you can put in a new one. So. We're going to practice doing that as well. The way that we're going to do that is we're going to use this stuff called solder braid um, or solder wick. It's this braided copper ribbon that can absorb some of the solder. Okay. Um, so, so the thing to do with the solder braid is that. Um, you, you actually want to make it as easy as possible for the solder to flow up into the braid. So to do that, you want to sort of compress the braid and um, widen it out to make those holes um, between the weaving a little bit bigger. So you, you compress this, and that makes 
makes the uh, holes a little bit bigger, makes it easier for the solder to flow into the braid. And then, the idea is that you lay the braid across the, your component that you want to remove, and you heat it up, and it absorbs the solder from that, uh, that joint that you're trying to undo. The funny thing about this process is that you actually have to put a little bit of solder on the iron in order to take the solder off the board. Okay? So you're using solder to remove solder. Again, the reason for this is because you need to transfer the heat from the iron to the board. And if you didn't have the solder, you just wouldn't transfer the heat. Okay? So you wipe the tip of the iron off. You put a little bit of solder on there. You lay the, the copper braid across the part that you want to remove, and then you, you touch the iron to the component. Okay? And ideally, you'll feel the component move a little bit. Um, and you'll see the braid sucking up some of the solder that was there. So you probably have to add a little bit of solder uh, after each time you do this. This is the hardest part of the whole exercise because you have to really get all of the solder out of that joint in order for the component to come out. If there's just a little bit left, the component is just going to be stuck. So you have to really get in there and um, suck out as much as possible. Sometimes you heat up the component a little bit first. Uh, sometimes it takes several attempts to get all of the solder. Okay. Now, it goes without saying that the soldering iron is very hot, right? So you never want to touch the tip of the soldering iron with your hand. You don't want to touch the iron to the desk or anything else because it will melt through anything that it touches or burn it. And when it's touching the copper braid. That copper braid conducts the heat pretty well. So it's good for conducting the heat into the board, but it will also conduct the heat right into your hands if you're not careful. So um, it, it definitely heats up when you're doing the, the desoldering. So you have to be careful with that. Okay? So again, you lay the braid on the component. You heat the component up with the iron, and you try and suck up as much solder as possible. Sometimes you can move the braid around, do that, um, and, and you just do whatever you can do to suck up as much solder as possible. Um, I don't think that this component is going to come out for me right now, but um, that's the idea. Just Work with it as much as you can, and uh, and see what you can do. Okay. So I'll pass the board around so you guys can see the, the little LED that I soldered in. One of the legs, like I said, makes a better joint. The other leg is kind of a cold joint. Um, so you can see how that goes. So again, the lab for today. You're going to start by soldering two ends of a wire together, then you're going to solder several resistors into a board, and then you're going to take some of those resistors out of the board with the desoldering technique. Do you have a question? Yeah, it was kind of hard to tell with the camera over that yeah. video. Were you touching the soldering iron to the copper? Yes, wire? yeah. Okay. You lay the soldering iron right on the copper. You, you push on there. You can push on the component to try and move the component around. and and you try and transfer the heat that way. Um, also, for next time, please bring your fiber optic communicator kits. These are the kits that you get from the bookstore. Okay. Um, so today we're just going to be practicing the soldering. Next time we're going to start assembling your kits. So please bring those with you. Um, so any questions about that? All right.
then let me take roll and I will let you go. Oh, one more thing. When you put away your soldering iron, you have to put it away um, in such a way that it will, it will stay in good condition. So what you do is that you, you want to do something called tinning the tip. This is coating the tip of the iron in solder and letting it sit there and, and stay there when the iron is cool. And what this does is that it, it protects the tip from corrosion. So you just take the iron, you can turn it off, and then while it's still hot, you take your solder and you just put a whole bunch of solder on the end of the iron. And you just get a really, really big glop on there and you just let it, you, you stick it back in its holder like that and just allow it to sit there and, and stay that way until the next person uses it. And then the solder, uh, the solder coats the tip and keeps it from corrosion. Okay. All right.